Greetings, cultivators from around the world. Jordan River here, back with more Growcast, occupying your healthy phylosphere. Today, we have Matthew Gates back on the line. He's a pest expert. He loves talking about insects and all that good stuff. We're going to talk about budworms today, but we're also going to get into mold and mildew. Awesome episode. We're starting up this month. October is Croptober. We're dealing with the end of grow cycles, you know, senescence, late flower, harvest, dry cure. And that's what we're going to focus on all month long. And Matthew Gates is going to talk to us today about what pests to look out for and avoid during the late flower stage. I know you're going to love this episode. Before we get into it, though, shout out to Photon Tech, the sexy red high performance LED lights. You can find them at growcastpodcast.com slash photon. Code Growcast saves you 10% on some amazing magnetic high efficiency bar lights. I love my 600 watt. Let me tell you, these things are off the chain. The magnetic bars make it easy to put together, uh, easy to disassemble and reassemble. If one goes out, you can pop it off and mail it back. They'll replace it. It's got a five-year warranty, and they've got just about the best efficiency and PPF in the game. The 1,000-watt Shane from Migro said it was too powerful. That's right. You're going to need to dim this thing down unless you have everything dialed in. The PPF is almost 3,000 U-moles, folks. The 1,000-watt, they require CO2 supplementation. They're so powerful. Photon Tech Lighting, baby. Code GROWCAST, 10% off. Get the square models if you have a 2x2 or 3x3. Get the 600-watt if you're in a 5x5. The 465 is perfect for a 4x4. And the 1,000-watt is if you're crazy and you want one of the most powerful lights in the game. Code GROWCAST at growcastpodcast.com slash photon. That brings you right there. Use those savings and send us a snapshot of your code always to be entered to win free seats. Thank you to Photon Tech. I love them. They're powerful. They're efficient. They're easy to assemble. Truly one of the best lights on the market. Go and get it, everybody. Code GROWCAST. Hello, podcast listeners. You are now listening to GROWCAST. I'm your host, Jordan River, and I want to thank you for tuning in today. Before we get started, as always, I urge you to share this show, spread Growcast around, get a new smoker growing, or a new grower that smokes, smoking. Uh, (laughs) Turn someone on to growing is the best thing you can do. And of course, hit growcastpodcast.com forward slash action to see all the action from seed code to classes and membership. Everything's up there. Go check out all the action. Today, we have pest expert back on the line. Our friend from Zenthanol Consulting, Matthew Gates is on the line. What's up, man? I'm doing well. Yes, sir. Welcome back to the show. Thank you for joining us. I appreciate it. I always enjoy it. Yeah, man. You were just on Growcast TV a couple of times. Some good episodes up there. What are you doing? You around consulting, I imagine, end of the year, probably pretty busy for you doing some consulting and that sort of thing? I would say so. Generally speaking, a lot of people who contact me for the first time Oftentimes, it's a mixture between people who are being proactive, but mainly it's people who are in damage control mode. Something has happened, right. has gone poorly. And a lot of times that happens around harvest. Sometimes it, a lot of times it happens before, like in summer, but the end of the year has its own sort of constraints. No kidding, man, especially for outdoor growers, obviously, because you're going with the seasons. But we're going to get into all of that here. You know, it is Croptober. And that's what we're going to focus on all month long is specifically outdoor end of season, but really just the end of season in any given cycle. So we're going to talk about senescence this month. We're going to talk about harvest, dry and cure. And today we're going to talk about the pests that come along with the end of the cycle, because it's weird how the, the pests evolve as the habitat evolves. Right. So you're not worried about botrytis so much in veg. Whereas some insects would love to ravage your garden, whether it's seedlings or flowers. But what are you most concerned about late in a plant cycle? What do you see as the most common pests when you're going around this time of year? What plagues us late in a cycle? I feel like sort of the the two big ones that come to my mind are the budworms, because a lot of the moths are very active in like late summer to autumn. And also before that time as well. But a lot of, for a lot of people, that's when a lot of their crop is coming to a head. And it's when those budworms kind of start out. And um, maybe even a lot of their damage has uh, sort of intensified around this time. And the other one, which is often associated with budworms, is uh, Botrytis cinerea. 
uh, Bud Roger gray mold, also an incredible problem. That and other molds that kind of become a problem during harvest with dense nugs and maybe sometimes a lack of uh, airflow or high moisture content in the air on the surface of the plant can help with uh, fungal growth. And then, of course, as a post-harvest pest as well, if you're not out of the woods yet, then you have to store things appropriately. You have to, of course, dry here appropriately. And, um, you know, at scale or even at a smaller scale, it can be very difficult to do that effectively, especially if you're new to it. Yeah, no kidding, man. You can make or break a great grow in that last few weeks or even after harvest, like you said. Now, budworms, that doesn't sound very scientific. What a, Usually you're coming at us with the Latin names. What are these budworms? They're the larvae of moths, you said? That's right. So the Helicoverpa genus is, and several species in that genus, and, a, and one or two outside of it are collectively often called budworms. But it's just a common name, like you say. So technically, you could perhaps find other caterpillars, moth larvae, sure. that um, kind of fall into this group. But yeah, a lot of these are, they're part of a family of moths called the noctuids, which are the owlet moths. And they're kind of large. A lot of people have probably seen them without knowing, you know, what group they're a part of. And with cannabis in particular, what will happen is that those moths will become active sometimes and depends on where you are in the world. But these are globally found. Different species are more common in different parts of the world. And I've made presentations on this subject uh, that you can find on YouTube. So if you're curious to know a lot of those details, you can certainly find them there. Send them all on YouTube, y'all. Give a subscribe. Exactly. Yeah. And I, I'm really very proud of a presentation I did on the Future Canvas Projects 02 channel, the FCP02. I go into great detail there. So another place you can check out that info. But basically, there's three main species. We have the corn earworm, which is Helicoverpa zia. We have the cotton bollworm, which is Helicoverpa armigera, which is oftentimes associated with sort of Eurasia and Asia and that kind of area, whereas the corn earworm is more associated with like North and South America. Oh, okay. But this second one is also found in South America as well, and also in North America more and more. And then the third one is the tobacco budworm, which is Chloridia virescens. And so these three are kind of the three species that I think of the most, although in the field, you can't always tell the difference between them very well. And honestly, a lot of times it's not going to be possible to do so, but they have very similar sort of life cycles and they have sort of similar, you know, susceptibilities. So you can kind of, a lot of times you can kind of treat them the same synonymously. Budworms are budworms is what you're saying. And I know these are a big problem, like you said. Uh, I guess the moths, what, lay their eggs on the flower? Why, why, why is that their game? And, and then the, the, the worms are eating the bud and, like, shitting in there, causing the botrytis? That's what I was told. I don't know if that's scientifically accurate. <laughs> yeah, and actually, it's, it's, a, it's a question that even I have exactly. What is this relationship? You know, we know from... So these budworms attack all kinds of plants. They're, a, they're, a, they're an incredible... You know, just to get out of the way, in case people are feeling bad about their crop, you know, budworms cause multiple billions of dollars annually. In fact, the the cotton bollworm in particular, you know, it can be up, it's estimated up to seven billion dollars annually. On cotton or just on, on everything is what you're saying? Yeah, on every, and that's just plant, yeah, that's just recorded plants, um, crops that we, you know, like cotton, for example, and Damn. various other plants as well. Yeah, it's incredibly, incredibly problematic. So, of course, <laughs> of course, it's also a problem in cannabis, which is itself incredibly expensive to cultivate, but also it's kind of a, you know, a luxury crop, but also a medicinal crop. And so it's hard to really estimate how damaging it is officially. <laughs> we need to record that number for sure. Yeah. Uh, so anyways, uh, what happens is that the, the moth likes to lay the eggs on the flower of various plants because the budworm will quickly hatch and then it will burrow into the flower. And when it does that, it does a lot of good things for itself. It shelters itself from the environment. So, you know, intense ultraviolet radiation and various predators and parasitoids that might, you know, come and try to kill it in one way or another. 
Uh, so it's sheltered from all of that. It's sheltered from, you know, heat and also, you know, humidities <laughs> and, and rain and pesticides and other things you might be trying to apply. He, it's a perfect little home. He's got a fucking apartment, a temperature controlled apartment in your nice dense bud. And he's making his home in there. And, and that's a good point. It's a survival tactic on their part. They're safe in that dense cola. Exactly. And, you know, a lot of people might think that the trichomes or their defense compounds might dissuade them. But in some cases, they're as adults, they're attracted to some of those compounds that we also enjoy. Mm. And the larva has no qualms with uh, feeding on those, on those buds. So they produce these tunnels and they, of course, wound the plant pretty significantly when they do so. They start small. And their damage starts small, but they rapidly grow. And so, so does the damage. And if you have a moth that comes through your crop and maybe lays upwards of several hundred to you know, almost a thousand eggs, <laughs> which has been documented in other cases. Oh. Yeah. So that, that, all of that sort of damage intensification on like a gradient, it all kind of intensifies at the same time. So you might not notice the problem until it becomes a big problem all at once, because all the larvae are kind of developing at around the same time in different parts of your crop, if that makes sense. Whoa, that is a really good point. When you have a spider mite infestation in your room and you like brought it in, or there's one cut that has it, you're going to notice that, that that plant in the corner has the most webbing and it's spreading out from there. And the longer you wait, it spreads out. Whereas with this insect, what you're saying is they're all developing at the same time. So day one, it's fine. Day two, it's fine. The larva developing. Day three, you see the damage. It's everywhere. They're all the same age. They're all fucking up your crop. I didn't think about that. Like you said, the damage intensification on kind of a, on, on kind of a, a graph. That is fascinating. Yeah, and it definitely changes the strategy that you have to implement for prevention, but also for treatment as well. And it's one reason why, you know, some people might not be used to this concept, but, you know, it's why considering your location is so important for, for several pests like this one. It's also very important to time your crop as well. A lot of people can't really, you know, change where they're going to live or where they're going to cultivate. So they don't have a lot of control over that oftentimes. But you can sort of... Um, avail yourself if you can time things appropriately. In some places, maybe you can skip the most intense season for the budworms. In other cases, you'll have to use barriers and other sorts of things to defend yourself. Right. Like some, uh, they have the netting. They have the, what is it called? It's insect netting or whatever that you put over your plants to exactly. avoid those. What What's the busy season for moths though? When is that? Like, does it depend on where you are probably? It does. So like these moths can be, in some places, they can be kind of active or start to be active, like maybe in some cases the beginning, but also the midway through like springtime and, you know, cards on your, on the table. I'm a Southern Californian. So <laughs> um, it's always springtime there. Yeah. So the season the and the breeding season, essentially, or the number of generations you can get will increase or decrease. If you're above like the 40th, latitudinal line in, in like a northern hemisphere, then a lot of times as the life cycle goes, the larva eats, it comes out of the flower, it finds a place on the ground, it burrows in the ground, it pupates, it turns to a little cocoon, and then the moth emerges out when it warms up again. So they kind of overwinter as this sort of pupal stage in the ground. So in some places it gets way too cold and they die. And that's above this 40th sort of parallel. If they're below that, and climate change has made this maybe a little bit more contentious about where this is and how it happens. But if you're below that, you're probably going to have, you may have more than one generation. That intense period will sway, I would say, probably summertime, whenever it gets warmest. And a little bit after that is probably when they're the most intense. Mm. And also one other important thing to consider is that they can move great distances They've been tra they've traveled like almost like 400 or 500 or even longer uh, kilometers, at like multiple states over. So even if you're in this sort of northern latitude, given enough time, a lot of these moths will reproduce and then kind of scale north and also south. And 
this is also a problem because different species and populations are exposed to different problems, environments, pesticides, and they're already incredibly good at resisting many chemistries. So then they will mate and sort of pass those traits along, which makes them an even greater threat than they already were. It's creating super bugs is essentially what you're saying. Exactly. We have a Starship Troopers situation on our hands soon. Yeah. You know, I spent some time in Hawaii. I have family out there and just like just scratching the surface of like Hawaiian cannabis history and all of that. And talking to the local growers, the moth problem is insane. It's their number one threat out there. And it's it's such a nice season that I think it's all year round they deal with this virtually. It seems like, and we're going to get into other pests that affect the indoor growers. Don't don't tune out yet, guys. It seems like this is one of the most, like you said, common plagues for the outdoor grower. And aside from netting, how do you keep a moth out of your garden? Not very well. Yeah. <laughs> Without some sort of physical structure, there's really not very much you can do. I do want to say that a lot of people have the idea that you can apply certain compounds and certainly you could apply some that are safe, but will also like kill the larvae in that small interim between egg and burrowing into the flower. But um, by the same token, you have to do that multiple times potentially because those moths are all around. And how would you know? Exactly. How would you know? How would you know? You, you would know because you were trapping certain species at the beginning of your season to find out when you have them you know, with pheromones, you use pheromones to attract some males and those traps exist. And if you want to be preventative, you would do that. But a lot of people Damn. don't do that. And also it still doesn't really tell you necessarily, you know, you don't know when the first one's coming and it's still an approximation. And like I said, it travel like hundreds of kilometers. So you locally, you might have it one way, but then you might have this large influx that comes in later on. So yeah, you can't really repel them with compounds or anything like that. It doesn't work for most insects. You can't like plant companion plants. They'll probably eat those if they flower, you know? So it's a very narrow selection of options for a lot of growers, especially outdoor. Now, what about moth lights or those bug zappers? I want to know what's your opinion on this. Is it like at that point, are you attracting them to your location or is that effective in, in killing the ones around you that you don't want on your plants? Bug zappers are sort of a double-edged sword Speaking neutrally, I would say that you can have that effect where, you know, the UV light attracts all kinds of insects, including things that you might not want to be around you or that you might not want to kill. Moths that aren't really a threat to your, to your uh, plants, but are native and help with pollination. Some poor monarch flying by. <laughs> right. Um, you know, sort of things like that. Uh, flies, mosquitoes, perhaps other sorts of things. All kinds of things. I don't like bug zappers because they're kind of a wanton killing machine and they kill a lot of things that you shouldn't try to target. Right. But at the same time, they will kill some moths. But I do feel like the juice isn't really worth the squeeze a lot of times with bug zappers for that attraction that you're referring to. That's exactly what I was worried about, right? Whenever these traps have bait, it's like, well, am I, aren't I just attracting more then? What? <laughs> so that, that's always confusing. But, but the physical barrier, the mosquito netting, that's what I was trying to think of earlier. The mosquito netting is what you can buy. And uh, I hear it recommended all the time for these outdoor growers to keep these moths from laying their eggs right on your flower. So it's, it seems like that's really the only preventative option. What do you recommend people do if it's already happening or with the bud? that has botrytis in it. Are you going to wash that? You're going to throw it out and compost it? What do you think? Yeah. So like in both cases, I'll attack the budworms first and then I'll get to the botrytis. So like with the, with the moths, if you're currently dealing with a problem, so you're actually dealing with multiple problems at once. Obviously, you have these larvae in your buds. So, you know, and depending on your scale, this will be onerous or less so. But you're going to have to look through all your plants. You probably figured it out because there's, Browning, right? Either it be a large hole. That's very obvious. Sometimes the larvae, I find, not always, but sometimes the larvae will like exit the flower and like feed on the outside and kind of not be sheltered. Which you know, strike that one out from the gene pool, kill it immediately. Uh, you know, uh, made a mistake. But that can also be a way that you can tell 
So you can apply, and there are entomologists who are researching this currently, but uh, one of the most common recommendations and what I also recommend is the use of biopesticides. So microbial organisms like the bacteria Bacillus thuringiensis, there's the Kirstaki and the Aizawi strains that are kind of for caterpillars in particular. It's right. very specific to that group. And so if you get that BT, it's very effective. And you can apply that. And ideally, you'd be applying it before you sort of notice your first mods. But if you're not, you get the best, the second best thing you can do is apply it after the fact. And usually you have to apply it multiple times. If it were me, I would be doing a combination of scouting for damaged flower and cutting it off, especially if it's molding, you know, just culling it, see, putting it in a, like a bag or a container and that you can seal and properly dispose of. Because if you have the mold, like now I'm getting into sort of the botrytis aspect, you know, those spores are kind of everywhere. And so obviously they're out in the environment and that sort of thing, but the spores have to germinate to be a problem. And so if you're able to cut away the production of those spores, that's of course going to be really helpful for that because not all of them are going to germinate. Not all of them are going to be even very effective. Each spore is kind of like a dice roll for this fungus. And so they make like hundreds of thousands of them and, you know, the odds are in your favor that way. So it's nuts. Yeah. So, so, so yeah, so you, you want to be sort of preventing more damage to your plants while also applying a substance like BT. You can also apply, there are viruses out there, specifically a uh, helicoverpa nucleo polyhedrovirus is the long form name of this virus that you can apply to your flower and only targets these particular larvae, specifically these budworms in particular. So there's advantages to that because you're not killing other organisms potentially, but it's kind of expensive and not everyone can get access to it. And again, just like with the BT, you're probably going to be applying it multiple weeks because the breeding season is multiple weeks. So yeah, and with Botrytis, it's sort of the same thing. You want to be limiting their growth on your plants. And if you're already in the midst of it, you can apply things like potassium bicarbonate. And there are some other sort of safe substances that you can apply that will kind of retard their growth and keep them from being able to grow on the rest of the flowers. But it's very taxing to do so. What do you think about these enzyme products? Like, because I'm only applying biocontrols, like some sort of bacteria, maybe, or like an enzyme, right? And and we're a big fan of, uh, well, I, I don't want to like set you one way or the other. I want, an, I want an unbiased opinion. But um, a product like Amazing Dr. Zymes, which is in, supposedly an enzyme formula, breaks down soft-bodied insects. Would you say that would help uh, in a situation like this? Or what do you think? Or um, for like the botrytis? For the larval stage, I'm thinking. I I'm sorry, to be more specific. You were saying this time between, it's jumping back a little bit, this time between when they're laid and when they're kind of burrowing. Would an enzyme product be beneficial there or no? It's possible it could be. The thing that matters is that uh, if you use a contact killing substance, like coverage is incredibly important. It's also important for the BT. So like, you know, just to be more specific, whether you use something like that, which I'm not sure the effectiveness of for the budworms or for the BT, you've got to make sure that you make contact. If you don't make contact, then hopefully it has some sort of uh, toxic effect. Of course, not on the end user, but on the specific organism. Because the BT has to be usually ingested. Right. So if you don't spray evenly or thoroughly, you're not going to do anything. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So, and not everyone can, not everyone applies the same way and not every setup is made the same way. And like speaking from, you know, personal experience, guiding people who are spraying at various scales, it's very complicated and it's arduous and it's a hard, it's a tough job. It's a tough job, and sometimes that can cause people to be ineffective with spray coverage. Right. All right, everyone, we'll be right back. But before that, I've got some big news for you from the FOOP. October 10th and October 11th are Amazon Prime Days, and FOOP is rolling out a killer sale for it. 
everything, basically everything from the Foop is 20% off. But here's the thing, they're not waiting for Prime Day to start. 20% off is live right now. And it's all on Amazon Prime, which means 24 to 48 hour delivery. And you can go straight there by going to amazon.com slash foop. You see their store right there on Amazon in one simple page. Now, here's the thing. Don't want to support Amazon? No problem. Since Foop is running this huge sale on Amazon, they're going to match it on their website. So you can go to the foop.com, 20% off everything. There's even some products up there like the gallon pack that isn't available on Amazon. That's 20% off too. And don't think you're going to pay shipping just like Amazon Prime, free shipping throughout this Croptober sale. So it's Amazon Prime Day and it's Foop Croptober from October 3rd today on through Amazon Prime Day. And again, I don't got to tell you why I love Foop from the foliar to the sweetener, the gel. I use them because you guys know I've been toying around with a couple different nutrition schedules now, but there's something about that Foop flavor. There's something about the aquatic microbe delivery from the fermented or whatever they do, the processed fish waste that I can't get away from. It seems like just a few applications in bloom. I can run it in ProMix, whatever it may be. I get that flavor that I like, that expression that I like, and I believe that it's coming from that aquatic input. I also love their clone gel. You've heard me talk all about it. You can find all of it from their nutrients to their spray to their gel at thefoop.com. 20% off starts today, and it's uh, while supplies last. Also find them amazon.com slash foop, and they're doing the Prime Day sale. And now, everybody, be healthy, go organic, use foop, all available starting today, October 3rd. Thank you to the foop certified organic. All right, let's get back to it. I would like to ask you a question about Botrytis from a kind of grower perspective. You know, they talk about this Botrytis really being, and I don't know how much of this is related to budworms or not, but I guess it's a little bit of a shift. This will apply to indoor growers as well, but sometimes growers are worried about their colas being too big because the center of that cola supposedly could have such a high humidity and there's no airflow that Botrytis is more likely to take hold there. Do you give any credence to that? And as a grower who's like really familiar with these pests, both insects and molds and stuff, do you think about colas getting too big and rotting from the inside or are you not concerned? Oh yeah, I definitely am concerned. And I think it, it points to maturation in the understanding of what you need like uh, for breeders who are breeding cannabis potentially, but also for cultivators and their selection of plants. Maybe it makes more sense in some cases to have plants that don't grow so massive as you're describing in that way. But maybe that would make um, harvesting more difficult or the processing of the bud sort of more laborious. And maybe that doesn't work out. You know, different places will have different requirements for that kind of thing. But for botrytis in particular, and also for other mildews like powdery mildew, for example, like there is actually kind of a balance point now, like usually it's 90 or 100% moisture level, which is literally like liquid water being on the surface of the plant that can actually kill or essentially drown the spores. Um, Not that I'm suggesting that people should be (laughs) like uh, filling their grow tent with water. Is that water tight? Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Right, exactly. But, um, you know, there is sort of a, uh, a limit to their moisture loving. But yeah, high humidity, high relative humidity in the air, but also high what's called absolute humidity, kind of like at a certain point on the surface is really great for spore germination. And in a lot of, a lot of cases, in many environments in a natural scape, what would happen is the humidity would be there and then it will go away at some point. And you know, perhaps the fungus kind of grows during that humid section and in that humid area. And then as things sort of desiccate and become drier, at that point, maybe the fungus has produced a bunch of like structures for making spores. I mean, probably very many. And when things dry, in a lot of cases that can have, that can kind of make the spores more airborne, essentially, like the the spores will break off of the, exactly. And that can kind of cause a popul- a colonization event to kind of spread yeah, quicker. That is crazy. This stuff does freak me out. Uh, you know, we'll have Jason Hadley on and he talks about how much of the stuff is in the air and every breath we breathe. Yeah. So it's constantly present is the idea. And you just try to deter it and hope that your cultivars are maybe a little resistant to it. How much do you buy into that 
I seem to see, I mean, something like powdery mildew, I definitely see a difference. Botrytis, I, I don't have enough experience with. Not that I, I actually have never had powdery mildew in my garden. What I'm saying is I see a lot of growers who get powdery mildew on one cultivar and not another. Do you think that this type of mold and stuff can be resisted by certain cultivars and we could select for that sort of thing? Or is botrytis an indiscriminate killer? It's a very good question for botrytis because for a long time, people were only familiar. And I just got done writing an article actually for Beer Bros Farm. So if you want to check that out, uh, it'll be there in several weeks. But, you know, we, all, we mostly focus on the pathogenic strain. But believe it or not, it's actually incredibly, incredibly diverse. And we didn't know that until like about 2008, 2009. And what I'm getting at here is that, yes, to answer your question, I do think that selection pressure, or rather, not just selection pressures, but also, you know, resistance breeding can have a great effect. Specifically for powdery mildew, there's some really great work for what are called the mildew locus O genes. They help with mycorrhizal connections with the plant, but also they allow certain mildews and other pathogenic fungi to colonize the host. So it's kind of a double-edged sword, these, um, these genes. And if some of them are absent, then a very robust resistance kind of develops. But it also plays havoc with the ability for the plant to interact with beneficial fungi. So there's some important sort of aspects of that to get right. With botrytis, however, long and the short of it is that it tends to exploit the cell's antivirus defense, which is for it to kill itself and deny the, a virus its ability to reproduce in the cell. So what the botrytis often does is it interacts with the plant on a level that makes it sort of asymptomatic and sort of not very problematic. And other strains are not pathogenic or parasitic at all. In fact, in some evidence, we see the, the suggestion that parasitic botrytis that causes all this mold problem that we interact with is sort of a evolutionary offshoot from much more mild, much more possibly in some cases beneficial strains of, of botrytis, which is really fascinating to me. But essentially, they move from this sort of nice form to a what's called from a biotrophic form to a necrotrophic form. And so it influences the cells to. It makes them think that they have a virus, essentially. Uh, I'm being very simplified here, but essentially it, it turns on some triggers and the plant cell kills itself. It autolyses and then it just sops up and eats all of the innards of the cell and then grows and grows and grows. And in that way, it can be very difficult to create a resistance. It's, it has a high host range, which I just feeds on hundreds of different plants of very disparate relations. So Anytime an organism is good at that, it's usually very competent at suppressing plant defenses and influencing other factors of the physiology. And what we've also learned is that it can pass in a lot of plants from parent to offspring as a seed endophyte. So it can exist in a plant symptom asymptomatically, and then it might start to show symptoms when the plant only when the plant matures or is under certain stressors in some cases. We don't know how much that's true for cannabis, but these fungal endophytes can live inside the seed and also be present in the plant as it sprouts and grows. And in some plants, there's no symptoms ever, and it kind of remains an endophyte that is like neutral or beneficial. In other plants, it just kind of patiently waits until it starts to produce reproductive structures, and then the botrytis sort of triggers. So yeah, there's a lot to botrytis that people don't necessarily appreciate. And the reason I bring it up is just to sort of acknowledge that one, it's highly versatile. And like I said before, every spore is a little dice roll, a genetic lottery. And uh, some might have increased virulence traits and some might be less effective. And, you know, depending on the environment that they find on the surface of the leaf, they, it might be a really great, you know, what, what could have been really good, but it got stuck on a trichome and died. You know, so Jeez. there's a lot of, there's a lot of factors there to uh, consider and botrytis is probably going to be a lot harder for people to breed resistance for than like powdery mildew, although wow. it itself has its own little lottery system. What can you tell us about powdery mildew? I mean, 
honestly, it seems like an easier thing to defeat. I see a lot of growers maybe see a little bit of it or take in a cut that has it and they need to treat it. Whereas botrytis can really fuck up a whole harvest. And not to say that I've seen powdery mildew get out of control too, totally like that. Don't get me wrong, but it seems that powdery mildew is easier to combat. But what do you think about, about powdery mildew and its behaviors? So I know that, um, so powdery mildews have this thing about them where they have a really large genome. They got a lot of genes at their disposal. A lot of them are copies. A lot of them are copies of, again, what I said earlier, what are called uh, virulence genes or genes that produce traits that might help them in any number of ways to like penetrate the cell structure or suppress the immune system or deliver toxins or something like this. And with powdery mildew, it has a lot of areas in its genome that essentially are like, I guess you could say they're randomizers. So when they make a bunch of asexual spores, see, with sexual reproduction, the big benefit, the big downside is you have to find a partner and select them or not. The the big upside is that you get this sort of like hybridization and the sort of like vigor. You get this sort of um, this combination mixture that is oftentimes beneficial. Right. Yeah. And with asexual organisms, they're oftentimes clones of themselves. But in powdery mildew and botrytis and many other pathogenic fungi, each spore will probably have a couple of mutations or essentially it will be like this. And so you don't actually get a clone, you get like an off clone and you get, you know, you get thousands or possibly trillions of off clones depending on the fungus. And again, this really makes them able to compete with a robust immune system like cannabis. But Damn. yeah, so, so I mean, when people talk about breeding, when people talk about their trials, I think it's really important that people are intellectually honest about how they came to that conclusion. I am a stickler for <laughs> sort of an, an empirical, yeah, an empirical sort of uh, evaluation. One great way to do that is not, it's true though, to a certain degree, a lot of places they will, if they reliably get powdery mildew in a certain location and they didn't get it, then that could, there could be something there. Absolutely. But it's still a little bit mysterious as to what exactly happened. Sure. What a lot of pathologists do is they take a powdery mildew patch and then they try to like put it on a plant that they think might be resistant. And they literally like put the leaves together and like deposit spores and see if they germinate. And if they do under ideal conditions, then maybe there were environmental factors that were causing the majority of the resistance. It wasn't what we call gene-based resistance, which you can breed for. Right. Yeah. So I would like to see a lot more attention drawn to that while also acknowledging that it is possible that somebody can breed resistance, first of all, without confirming it, second of all, without realizing it. Sure. But in a professional setting, I would hope to see more of the, the proven metrics. And that's becoming more and more easier for people to accomplish. So I'm, I'm very excited about that. Well, we've talked about that before, right? Which is, it, it's just funny what testing consists of. And nobody wants to release a bunch of aphids in their room. Nobody wants to release powdery mildew in their room at the end of the day. You're only doing it for science. So you're right. I'd like to see more of that as well. I want to jump back though to something you said, because this is kind of, I, I, I would, I guess, classify this as basic, but I didn't know it. The multiple ways that powdery mildew can reproduce. You said that it can reproduce both sexually and asexually. And I've seen kind of visual representations, <laughs> That's, that sounded funny, of this and um, showing the differences, but I, I didn't hear it put the way you said it, which is sexual reproduction can create this hybridized vigor. And that sounds like, you know, that's almost back to cannabis breeding. That makes a lot of sense. If you get two powdery mildew spores or entities to breed, you're going to get a more hybridized, vigorous strain of powdery mildew is what you're saying. Yeah, most likely, uh, at least, you know, maybe not in every case, but sure. essentially, yeah, you've got this merging and, and just like, I want to be really upfront. I'm not a mycologist and I'm certainly not an expert on fungal reproduction. It's very complicated. I know a little bit about it. Yeah. You're the pest guy. Sometimes I forget you're the pest guy because yeah. you're also like a grower, but, but go on. Oh, I meant insect guy. I, I said pest. I meant insect. I, I'm, I love all of it. Don't get me wrong. I like to, I like to look and consume research about all kinds of these 
organisms. But I just want to be upfront that the mechanisms are incredibly complicated. But my understanding, you know, which is adequate but not extensive, is that the powdery mildew and other fungi, you know, there's a massive selection pressure for them to be effective. Again, we have also talked about this as well, people's perception about like plant health and capability for defense and things like this. A lot of people put stock in the fact that a plant should be able to just repel as long as it's like, you know, strong and healthy. It should be able to repel all problems. But in nature, that's not even what happens. At the very best, you can hope for a lot of times is that the uh, organism, the host, is like just not detrimented too much by the presence of an insect feeding or a fungus growing. Right. You know, maybe you can, and that's what resistance really means. It doesn't mean that it like is repelled and like dies immediately, although that does happen as well. And so powdery mildews and other fungi have to make use of as many options as possible. And so sexual reproduction does sometimes happen. You get multiple patches, they, the hyphae inter- interlock, they interconnect. And they might even be sister spores, essentially, you know, because they might come from the same a progenitor. At the same time, though, maybe that, that doesn't happen. That's okay, too. They make hundreds of thousands of asexual spores, you know, if they're able to really colonize a host. And, you know, because if that spore gets on a leaf and that spore germinates and that hypha, you know, makes a little penetration peg and gets into the plant cell, you know, if you can't do all that, it's dead. There's no recourse. It's it's gone. It will not be successful. So there's so much riding on the spore, getting into the plant and being able to suppress the, the plant's immune system locally and then grow and build up from there. If they weren't very good at that, they wouldn't exist. Man, I totally see what you're saying. And let me ask you this on the subject of kind of repelling and what's going on in the phylosphere. Does that lend credence to this idea that there's limited space on that phylosphere? And so if you can get kind of a thriving bacterial type application, it could help with some of these things. Have you, have you observed that? I think it helps to sort of visualize the surface of the planet as like an alien world, because it is. It's like an alien forest with glandular and non-glandular trichomes and stomata and waxes and cutin and all that kind of stuff. So in a lot of ways, I agree with, and also, like you said, there's various microbes on the surface, below the surface of the, the plant's body in the phylosphere. And so I think that there is something to be said of establishing microbes in this sort of, as like a biological armor, it's like a preventative measure, a shield. There are, there are products that are made exactly for this purpose. So it's, it's, it couldn't hurt. It's certainly preventative in some aspects, but it's also not a fail safe, kind of like you said about how a lot of people attribute, you know, plant resistance to be some sort of fail safe. Certainly not going to save you from every situation, but you you give it the thumbs up. Yeah, definitely. And as we get better and better, you know, what I've said might become outmoded. Although I'm curious what you think about this, Jordan. And this is kind of how I feel with like hot plate and viroid, which isn't really quite on topic, but like it's a major, major problem, right? Sure. You know, what happens if, what ha- has happened in many other crops happens in cannabis where you get a particular strain of a pathogen that's very virulent and incredibly difficult to deal with. And people are able to breed resistances, but it's very sort of like narrow. It narrows what you can feasibly produce like in a field or an indoor facility. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think about that? Like, I've, I think that would kill the culture somewhat. I, I totally think that I'm so conspiracy driven that there's probably some people who would like to see that happen. <laughs> um, release some virus into the home grow scenario. No, um, it's very interesting, like you said, to take a look at how cannabis could fall victim to some of the other problems that other crops face, you know, whether it's uh, the, the economy of coffee to compare it to or something going wrong with, like you said, a viroid. The hop latent stuff seems crazy. I saw something that over 50% of the genetics in California were testing for this virus. I've seen growers have this virus and it leads to like dudding. Their plants just aren't producing trichomes. They, they don't get you high, they're worthless. It's like something created by Satan himself. I don't know really how to speculate on that, man. I, I agree. I, I think it would be terribly detrimental for the culture. 
And it would be a pandemic, right? It would be a plant pandemic is what you're talking about at the end of the day. And uh, we should do an episode on viroids because I feel like I could understand them better. And I just hope that it doesn't completely destroy some genetics and destroy more livelihoods and, and things like that. Now, tissue culture seems to be kind of a solution or at least some way to clean up these genetics, you know, this, this tissue culture cloning and they'll run pieces of the plant through this process and slowly get rid of some of these viroids through recloning and recloning and recloning with tissue culture. But I don't know. I'm not smart enough to, uh, to speculate on if that's going to be enough or, or whatever. What do you think, man? Well, in hops, it happened to hops, you know, so hop plants got hop plant viroid, right? And, uh, it, it made certain, made certain like varieties just untenable to grow. We just couldn't grow them anymore. You know how much, you know, and I, again, Southern California here. So you know how much people, especially in California, love their specialty brews. Oh yeah. You know, and other parts of the world, certainly. It's like if a cannabis person is very similar, right? Cannabis person. If somebody likes cannabis is like, Oh, I can no longer have Kush anymore or any of the or any of these particular lineages because they just don't have this resistance gene and hop lane viroids everywhere or powdery mildew is everywhere or a particular strain would just get in there and just wreck everything. Kind of like what's happening with the Fusarium tropical strain in uh, for bananas, you know? Oh, yeah, right. Bananas going extinct. I heard about that as well. Yeah. But like I said, man. There's probably some people who would like that so that their their stuff is the only stuff you can buy. There's people in the cannabis industry who would, that's their cream dream at the end of the day. So maybe I'm a little too conspiratorial, but. <laughs> well, don't be too, don't be, uh, don't feel too uh, out of sorts there because there was actually a plan, but as far as we understand, a never, never implemented plan by the U.S. government to, uh, he could find information. I know this sounds like a conspiratorial thing to say, but he could find this information I actually have this on my Cannabis Myths number one video on my Zentanol YouTube channel. So you can check that out there. But basically, there was a plan to use a special fusarium strain to surreptitiously inoculate a bunch of illegal grows. And this was, so, this was a few decades ago, but they never went and did it. And the reason for this is actually just a simple economy of scale. First of all, the amount of cannabis they'd have to grow in order to have this particular fusarium strain that's specific to cannabis and isn't, as for those who don't know, fusarium is a highly, highly, like botrytis, a highly variable, you know, highly host generalized pathogen. So you'd really be shooting yourself in the foot if you applied it and it, you know, ruined all of your crops for multiple generations. So oh my God. for that reason, yeah, for that reason and the reason of how many, how much you'd have to make and the logistics of applying it, it just doesn't make sense to do that. So despite, you know, does that mean that the government doesn't care or there aren't other people who might not be uh, very fond? No. But does it mean that they at least were smart enough to not like do something so crazy? I don't know. I, I guess that's a little bit endearing, right? Well, yeah, we'll see. Well, who knows why that one didn't get passed? I love those, like looking into those, um, you know, operations whether it's like MK Ultra or Paperclip or one of my favorites was uh, Acoustic Kitty, where they were trying to spy on uh, Nazi Europe with audio devices implanted in stray cats. They get pretty crazy, man. And if they didn't like cannabis enough, I'm sh like I said, I'm sure that they would love to release some plague onto us. Hopefully that they have they have bigger things in their sights now in 2022. But um, it seems to me like they wouldn't have any boundaries and they were tr they were at least considering, like you said, breeding some super fusarium just to fuck with us. That's crazy, man. Absolutely crazy. Yeah, I uh, I have to agree. You know, it's something to be aware of. But it's also, like you say, like I don't really know. I'm I'm inferring and I'm speculating from the document that was released, and you know, I'm not uh, naive enough to not recognize that maybe some things were redacted or. You know, other <laughs> ulterior motives exist. Yeah. But, you know, they, they did actually, I mean, ostensibly, there's a lot of people's names on it that, uh, you know, it seemed to admit to things that if they were redacting, they might have redacted. So I don't know. Uh, it's, a, it's an interesting thing to to consider. No, that's good stuff, man. I love I love that stuff. I'm into that. So funny, dude.
So uh, listen, we are here at the top of the episode. Anything else you have for us here, Matthew Gates, or uh, we can just jump right into where people can find you. Anything that you're, anything big you got planned? Well, generally speaking, I am, I'm trying to interact with more people online. I have my, my Discord server, my Patreon that people can find me at where I want to help people as much as possible, but I recognize that time is limited and it's very difficult to interact with people on social media because the limitations of those media. Yeah, no kidding. So you can find me on my Discord server for $1 a month. You can subscribe to my Patreon and you can gain access to it. We There's a, a group of over 130 people so far who are helping each other with IPM issues, uh, including myself. If you have problems, you want to send me a picture, you have a quick question, um, I'm able to answer those a lot easier for people that way. So trying to build that up a little bit, uh, sort of bring, give back to the community in that way. It's very important for me. I just wish that there was a medium that was more conducive to that kind of a thing. In addition to that, you can find my a lot of my pest primer videos and other information on my Sentinel YouTube channel. And also for professional inquiries, of course, I am available in a consulting capacity for those at home grow, but also at a commercial scale. Various problems that you might have with IPM from the planning stage to the harvest stage, I can help you out. And in a lot of cases, it's way less expensive than misidentifying a pest or misapplying the wrong thing just from labor time and product resources alone. So if you are interested, if you have an issue, I'm your guy. And uh, where where can they find that consulting? Where should they reach you? Oh, of course. Sentinel.com. Ah, the website, Sentinel.com, everybody. And subscribe on YouTube for sure. That's uh, that's where I'm subscribed. On Instagram at Sync Angel, at Sync Angel, S-Y-N-C-H-A-N-G-E-L. Thank you so much, Matthew. This was an awesome episode, man. We'll get you back on TV for the members real soon. We'll see you uh, at some upcoming classes and stuff. And thank you, man. Thank you for all you do and all the education that you put on. I really appreciate it. And it's very endearing to get the responses that I get. And I hope that I help as many people as possible through it. So I'm very excited. Thanks for having me, Jordan. Hell yeah, man. Of course, the Growcast audience loves you. So you can uh, look forward to more Matthew Gates in the future on this show. And stay tuned, folks. we got a whole month ahead for Croptober. You don't want to miss it. That's all for today. Be safe out there, everybody. We'll catch you next time. Grow smarter. That's our show. Thank you so much for tuning in, everybody. Thank you to Matthew Gates. Stay tuned for some more collaboration between Matthew Gates and Growcast. Got some big stuff in the works. I know you love that episode, everybody. Before we wrap it up, AC Infinity, everybody. The best grow gear in the game. Code GROWCAST15 saves you 15% at acinfinity.com. They've got the thick, sturdy tents with the thick canvas and the thick tent poles. The best tents in the game. They've got the fans that you need, the inline fans, the cloud ray oscillating fans now. Again, code GROWCAST15 for 15% off. The best quality grow gear you can find. They've also got lights and scissors and pots and hangers and so much more. But when it comes to the fans and the tents, there's no one else out there that does it better. The inline fans, the Cloud Line series are fantastic. The S series is the simple series, still comes with a 10 speed fan controller. And the T series comes with a controller that lets you automatically dial in your temperature and humidity. ACinfinity.com code GROWCAST15 for 15% off. They even have grow kits that come with everything you need to expand. Get that second veg tent, get that second flower tent you've been thinking about. Save with the kit and use code GROWCAST15, which now works on those kits. Saving you extra money with the best gear in the game, acinfinity.com. They've been our partners for years. We brought these guys along a long time ago. They've really, really expanded and done a great job. acinfinity.com, code GROWCAST15. And that's all, everybody. I hope you're doing amazing things in your garden. Stay tuned to GROWCAST. we got some powerful episodes coming up. I know you're going to love them. All right. Talk to you next time, everybody. Bye-bye. You know, makes a little penetration peg and gets into the plant cell.